Welcome to another one in our series of public lectures sponsored by the Murphy Institute Center for Ethics and Public Affairs. Uh, I don't have the exact date, but in a few more weeks we have Ann Cudd uh, coming who's going to talk on feminism and capitalism. So that should be uh, an interesting topic. Today, uh, we're very lucky to have Kevin Vallier, who is uh, a professor at Bowling Green State University, which in case you don't know it, is one of the major ethics and political philosophy centers in the country. Uh, Kevin is, uh, he did his undergraduate work at Washington University in St. Louis, uh, did his graduate work at University of Arizona, and uh, he's the author of two books, Liberal Politics and Public Faith, Beyond Separation, published by Rutledge in 2014, uh, and Must Politics Be War in Defense of Public Reason, Liberalism, Oxford University Press. It says under contract. Is it out yet or it's not? It'll come out next year. It'll come out next year. So you've got to wait for that one. And about uh, 30 or 40 articles in major journals. So it's a little Honest. bit about who uh, unless he says whatever. Uh, I should tell, say a little bit about who he is for those of you who don't know. Um, John Rawls developed a notion of public reason. Uh, there were many other people involved, of course. And uh, one of the people who was highly influenced by him, although who disagrees with him a lot, is Jerry Gauss, who teaches at University of Arizona. Uh, Professor Vallier and our own Chad von Schulant studied with Jerry Gauss. And this is a major tradition now in political philosophy. And now that Rawls is dead, somebody has to start uh, continuing work in that area and investigate. And uh, Vallier, Professor Vallier is really one of, if not the leading figure, along with Jerry Gauss, uh, working in this area. And there are now a number of people working in this area. So we're very happy to have him here. And uh, let's welcome him to the university. I um, am extremely grateful to be here. I didn't expect to be giving a talk in a chapel. I suppose someone who works on religion and politics, maybe this is the closest thing to a sermon uh, that I've given. I'll, I'll promise to uh, not be sort of lyrical and be rigorously philosophical. I, um, so if there's any general way to encapsulate my interests in political philosophy, it's that I'm interested in the liberal tradition. It's history to contemporary controversies, it's descriptive theory, the great tradition of liberal political economy, and it's normative theories, particularly what are known as social contract liberalisms. And among my interests in the liberal tradition is the great grand question of what could justify liberal institutions. I'll understand liberal institutions as constitutionally protected equal liberties. Civic liberties like freedom of speech and freedom of religion, procedural liberties like the right to fair trial, and political liberties like the right to vote. So that's the question I'm interested in. What could justify liberal democratic constitutional order? And in my view, the most promising theory to do this is what's known as public reason liberalism. Now what distinguishes a public reason view from all other varieties of liberalism is that it attempts to derive the case for liberal institutions from what I will call a public justification constraint. Now there are different versions of this constraint, um, but they all go a little something like this. For state power or coercion or the law to be morally permissible, it has to be justifiable to multiple reasonable points of view. So it's not enough to justify liberal institutions to say that it promotes the true understanding of the good. It's not even enough to say that it abides by the correct understanding of justice. The justification for political power has to be multilateral. It has to be, as Rawls called it, an overlapping consensus of reasonable comprehensive doctrines. But generally, the idea is that we have to converge on the case for liberal institutions uh, given our own perspectives and self-understanding. Now, there are many different versions, again, of this justification requirement. Uh, and there are a number of foundations that have been offered. Some have argued, I think, the most literal way to read Rawls, that it's, uh, the constraint is founded in justice. Others have argued that it's grounded in respect for persons as free and equal. 
Um, still others have said that it helps to establish moral relations that are non-authoritarian. Uh, and still others have argued that it is centrally about sustaining civic friendship. Now, I think all of these views have insight, but I think none quite get at the truth. And I'd like to try to give you what I take the normative heart to be by contrasting public reason uh, with two other perhaps more familiar options. On the one hand, we might take a picture of politics that says that politics is merely institutionalized aggression between competing centers of power that different people have different ideologies and the job of politics is to sort of control or dominate one another. And the case for liberal institutions is it provides the best stable balance between these groups. On the other hand, we might look at what are called perfectionist liberalisms, which try to base liberal institutions in a shared, substantive, detailed understanding of the good, usually as living autonomous lives. I think of public reason views as situating themselves somewhere in between. It maintains against the modus vivendi liberal that politics is fundamentally a moral enterprise. But against the perfectionist liberal, the public reason liberal says, we're not going to take a stand on issues where there's reasonable disagreement, on sectarian matters of religion and philosophy. So the goal of public reason liberalism is to establish moral relations between diverse people. So we want to show that political life doesn't have to be fundamentally strategic or are based in power relations. On the other hand, we recognize the depth of our disagreement, and so we try not to take a stand on those matters. So the heart of public reason is establishing moral relations between people who disagree. And while there are many kinds of moral relations, for me, the common denominator among all these moral relations are relations of social trust. So the foundation for me for the public justification constraint is the value of a system of trust between diverse persons. And so we arrive at my thesis. Public justification is grounded in the value of a system of social trust and what respect requires of persons who trust one another. So I'm going to proceed in the following way. First, I'm going to tell you the notion of social trust that I'm working with. Then I'm going to explain the value of a system of trust, which I think is enormous. But we'll see we can't justify and sustain such a system merely by pointing to its benefits. So we need to establish that we have some kind of moral obligation or duty to sustain this system of trust to realize the great value that it has. And I'll describe two kinds of duties of respect that people who trust one another owe each other. And the case for the public justification constraint will be this. The constraint figures into these two duties. That is, you can't fully flesh out the duties without appealing to the public justification constraint itself. What I'll do then is tell you about the way in which I fill out and understand this requirement. You might think it would be better if I told you up front exactly what the constraint was in my view, but I think it will be much easier to motivate my stance on this issue if I first tell you what its normative basis is. Then and only then will I arrive at the ultimate goal of the talk, which is to establish this claim that legal coercion requires public justification. The vast majority of the talk will be focused not on legal rules, but on moral rules, a kind of social norm that I think is at the heart of social order, rather than the law and the state and its power. But I can use the explanation of why these social norms, these moral rules, require public justification to explain why the legal order requires public justification. Now, unfortunately, one can't do everything in a talk. I've written on how you might derive a case for liberal institutions from the constraint. But here, I'm just going to give you an account of why I think the constraint holds and the way in which I understand it. And of course, there's a Q&A, so I'm happy to sketch out how my derivation of some liberal institutions will go once I've explained to you uh, the ultimate basis for it. All right, so let's begin with an understanding of trust. It's a little bit of analysis. Um, in the trust literature and philosophy, there is some disagreement about how to understand the idea, but there are agreement on a few central points. And one is that trust is more than mere expectation. Sometimes we say, oh, I trust that it will rain tomorrow, but we just mean I expect that it will rain. Because really, Trust involves relying on another agent, right? not just on your car, right? You rely on your car, you don't trust your car. You also, when you trust, you somehow make yourself vulnerable to people. 
So I can rely on someone to do something when I'm trying to manipulate them. But I think it would be wrong to say that I trust them. So when we trust, we have a kind of goal or interest that we need others to help us achieve in one way or another. Trust also involves some beliefs. We have to believe that others are necessary or helpful for achieving our goals, and we have to think that people are generally willing and able to do their part to achieve the goal. And so, here on the handout, we arrive at some necessary conditions on trust. And I say this, A trusts B to fee only if A has a goal, believes that B's feeing is necessary or helpful for achieving that goal, and that B is willing or able to do B's part in achieving the goal by feeing. So that's the rough, broad notion of interpersonal trust that I'll work with. Now, the talk is focused on a more general notion of trust, what's often called social trust or generalized trust. That's a trust held by society and that's placed in society. So it's a kind of less directly intimate form of trust, the kind of trust that we can have in strangers. And I'm also going to focus on a particular kind of social trust that many people in even the economics and political science literature uh, identify with social trust, but I want to bring out some of its distinctive elements. So I'll call this moral trust, and here's how I understand it. A public exhibits moral trust only if its members generally believe that others are necessary for achieving one another's goals and that members of the public are generally willing and able to do their part to achieve those goals knowingly or unknowingly by following publicly recognized moral rules. Now, what's a moral rule, I should say, first? Christine Bicchieri, in her important work on social norms, understands a social norm to be a kind of extant social practice that we conditionally prefer to go along with so long as we have what she calls empirical expectations and normative expectations. That is, we think everyone else will follow the norm, and we think that everyone else should follow the norm, including ourselves. Now, within the idea of a normative expectation, we might distinguish a kind of what we call moral normativity, where we think other people morally should go along with these norms, such that when they violate the norms, we think that what are often called the negative reactive attitudes of resentment and indignation are appropriate. So the system of moral norms that we have are ones that justify the moral emotions and they make blame and punishment appropriate responses to violations. In light of that, I think we can come up with a very vivid example of what moral trust involves. So just imagine the formal and informal norms that are involved with traffic. Whenever we're on the road, we're trying at a minimum to get from point A to point B. And we totally rely, and I think trust, on other motorists to enable us to do that. So we think that other people are necessary or helpful for achieving our goals, right? We need other people not to slam into us, to get out of the way, to not stop randomly. We have to believe that others are willing and able to do their part to help us achieve the goal, right? We have to think that they don't want to slam into us, that their cars function well, that they're not cognitively impaired. But of course, we rarely know where one another are going. And so we facilitate each other's goals by following publicly recognized social norms that I call moral rules. Now, some of our social norms are merely prudential. We think when someone violates them, boy, that was unwise, or that was foolish, or that was risky. But most of the traffic norms are infused with the moral emotions. When someone violates them, we don't just say, you made a mistake, um, with, you know, you did something foolish. We think, you did something outrageous. Right? When someone violates a traffic norm that hurts us, we resent them. And when we observe someone else engage in the violation, we're indignant with them. And not only do we feel this, but we react. We blame them, maybe we curse at them, we honk the horn, um, maybe we respond with some sort of extreme kind of road rage. But the traffic norm system is a system of moral rules. So a system of moral trust then with respect to traffic norms, is where there's a great degree of trust that people will generally follow these norms and that there's a preparedness to react with the certain reactive attitudes and blame and punishment in response to observed violations. And this allows me to define a very key idea that I'm working with throughout the rest of the talk, which is the idea of a system of trust. This is a society with high moral trust in a wide array of moral rules. So this is one that a society that doesn't just have high trust in its traffic norms, but in its political norms, its economic norms, the norms of civic society, and so on. 
So now I'll tell you a little bit about why I think it's valuable. The uh, heart of the value of social trust and the system of trust is that it has both what I'll call social value and relational value. The social value of social trust is um, the ability to form what economists and political scientists call social capital. And these are the networks with other people that we have that enable us to engage in mutually beneficial cooperative relations, both in the economy, political power, perhaps in our religious institutions or civic society generally. And there's been a huge amount of empirical literature on this. And it turns out that social trust is almost empirically magic. It makes all kinds of institutions work better than they otherwise would and sometimes makes it possible for them to work at all. It helps functioning democracy. It helps promote economic growth. It helps to promote, in some respects, economic equality, racial harmony, sometimes maybe gender equality, educational outcomes, non-corruption, um, trust in law enforcement, and on and on. Now, if this sounds a little too good to be true, I just encourage you to sort of start to look up some of this literature. It's remarkable. Now, these are correlations, and there's been a lot of work attempting to determine and separate cause from effect. But it does look like that social trust arguably causes, facilitates a variety of these good outcomes. So the value of a system of social trust is enormous, right? It makes our social institutions work, all of them. I think the other source of the value of the system of trust is it enables us to form valuable relationships, particularly relations of love and friendship. Now, low trust societies, societies that don't have much social trust, um, it's not that they don't have any trust at all. They have what's often called particularized trust. They trust people in their family. They trust people in their tribe. And of course, you can find your relations of love and friendship within the tribe, but you can't really form them with people outside. These are outsiders. They can't be trusted, and so forming your relations of love and friendship is going to face a variety of difficulties. And I think most of us, many of us have made friends outside the tribe. We find our significant others outside the tribe. And so many of the relations that we have simply could not be sustained in a low trust order. And even if you make your friends and find your lover within your tribe, if either of you change your social network, you can't maintain that relational grid when that person has left. Maybe the person moves away. Uh, maybe they change religions, um, maybe they change teams, in some other respect, political parties. And in a high trust order, you can maintain those valuable relations. I'd also argue that high trust orders are freer orders because people can form their projects and plans and live out their dreams in a way that allows them to rely on others to engage in certain kinds of behavior. But however much value the system of trust has, that isn't enough to motivate people to maintain it. And there are a variety of reasons for this. The most important reason is that it raises the fundamental issue of social dilemmas, which is that um, I can enjoy the benefits of the system of trust even if I myself am often untrustworthy. Now, others may detect my untrustworthiness, but perhaps I can get away with bad behavior while enjoying all the benefits that are provided. So it's not just enough to say to me, look how much value is produced by the system, because I could always say, I can get all that value and not be trustworthy. Another difficulty with citing the value of a system of trust is I think we can only rationally justify trust in others if we think that they're trustworthy. That is, we can't sort of lie ourselves into trust by saying, wouldn't it be good if I trusted this person? Because if they're not trustworthy, trust won't generally form. Now, some people talk about a notion of what's called therapeutic trust, where I decide to trust someone in the hopes that they'll sort of rise to the challenge. But in my view, that's a kind of false trust. It's an acting as if one is trusted. So for me, then, we have to show to maintain a system of trust that persons have good reason, and I think moral reason, to be trustworthy and to treat others as trustworthy. So we need to show that people have requiring reason, not just strong reason, to sustain the system of trust uh, and existence. So to do that, I have to revive an old argument from the public reason literature, and I won't give it to you, I'll just give you my argument, which is that respect for persons, that is the acknowledgement of the value and dignity of others, requires certain kinds of behavior that will sustain the system of trust. And it begins with the following observation, 
that once we have mutual trust, certain kinds of behavior are required out of respect for others. Two kinds of behavior in particular. Being what I'll call morally trustworthy and treating others as trustworthy. Because as I said, a system of trust is maintained by the perception of trustworthiness. And I'll understand moral trustworthiness as follows. It's a, you're morally trustworthy when you have a disposition to comply with moral rules that are the object of trust. So what we want to do is incentivize morally trustworthy behavior by appealing to duties of respect that people have to one another. Because if I can say, look, you're obligated to engage in trustworthy behavior, to expect trustworthy behavior, because if I just cite the benefits of the system of trust, that will not be enough to justify and sustain it. And again, as I said before, I'm going to give you arguments from respect, and the case for the public justification constraint will be that it figures into both of these duties. So now I'm going to give you my two arguments from respect, and we'll see the way in which the public justification constraint figures into those duties. The first will be an argument from trustworthiness, and it's what trustees owe trustors as a matter of respect. The other will be an argument from our system of accountability, and that will be an argument for what trustors owe trustees. All right, so we'll begin here at the bottom of the page with the argument from trustworthiness. Premise one, within a system of moral trust, if A respects other members of the system of trust, then A will be trustworthy by complying with moral rules that are compatible with A's deep commitments and values. The second premise says that A's compliance with moral rules is compatible with A's deep commitments and values if and only if the rules are publicly justified for A, from which it will follow that within a system of moral trust, if A respects other members of the system, that A will be trustworthy by complying with moral rules that are publicly justified for A. So you see that there's this duty of respect to be trustworthy with respect to publicly justified rules. So that will give us our first duty of respect and ground the constraint. But of course, I have to tell you why you should think the premises are true first. When I flesh out the notion of public justification that I'm working with, we'll see the case for the second premise. So I'll write a bit of a promissory note on it. What I want to focus on is the first premise, and I think in many ways it's fairly intuitive. Ordinarily, when others trust us, they're counting on us. They've made themselves vulnerable to us. And so the general proper response to trust is trustworthiness. That is, if other people trust us, we should be trustworthy in response. We should return trustworthy behavior for the trust that others place in us. But that's only a general duty. There are circumstances that might override it. Perhaps people trust us to follow rules that are very economically costly for us. Now, in those cases, I think, you know, oftentimes you should be trustworthy anyway, even if it comes at a cost to you. But there are certain kinds of moral costs that might accept you from your duty to be trustworthy to others. And that's if people are depending on you to comply with a norm that you regard as immoral or fundamentally incompatible with your principles. In that case, if you respect other people, the people that trust you, I don't think you're obligated to go against your conscience or your integrity or your deep commitments. And that's why you only have to be trustworthy with respect to rules that are compatible with your deep commitments and values. Now the case for the public justification constraint will be that it specifies the compatibility relation between the moral rules that our society applies to us and our deepest commitments and values. And I'll specify that here in a bit. So again, just a, a brief promissory note that I'll get to that in another section. But if what the public justification constraint can do, if it can give a philosophically attractive account of when compliance with moral rules is compatible or their deep commitments and values, then that's the way the public justification constraint will commend itself to us. So now we'll turn to what trustees owe trustors. And we'll begin here with premise three. And this is, premise is a bit more complicated. Within a system of moral trust, if A respects another member of the system of trust B, then A will only hold B accountable to moral rules, compliance with which is compatible with B's deep commitments and values. Premise four should be familiar. It's the same as premise two. Uh, B's compliance with moral rules is compatible with B's deep commitments and values if and only if the rules are publicly justified for B. So, same premise. Conclusion. Within a system of moral trust, if A respects B, then A will only hold B accountable to moral rules that are publicly justified for B. 
So I have to vindicate the third premise, and then I'll give you the case for premise two slash four here in the next section. If we don't trust one another at all, if we're totally unfamiliar with each other, even outside the ordinary bonds of society, we see each other strategically. You might imagine, you know, you meet another race of uh, humans or in particular, say, an alien race where we have no way of communicating, we have no way of understanding each other. We're going to tend to see one another as obstacles uh, to be conquered, to be avoided, or somehow overcome. But even when we partially trust people, we take what the philosopher P.F. Strassen said was the participant perspective. That is, we see others as agents and not as mere obstacles to be overcome. We don't just look at people as we look at our cars, right? We look at people as responsible agents, agents that can be held accountable for how they respond to the different duties and moral requirements that apply to them. And the reactive attitudes that I mentioned earlier of resentment and indignation are rendered appropriate within such a system. Because we only hold people accountable when we think that they're culpable, when we think they should have done other than they did. Now, trying to make sense of when people are accountable requires understanding what are sometimes called the exculpatory conditions. That is, when we would ordinarily think someone is accountable for their behavior, for bad behavior, say, um, but they're somehow excused. Now, people can be excused from violating ordinary moral rules for a variety of reasons. For instance, you might find that you violated a moral rule entirely by accident. Or perhaps you violated the moral rule because you were responding to another moral rule that conflicted with it, but that was more important. But I think there's another kind of exculpatory condition that um, in some places in philosophy is a little bit controversial. And that it's that people might be ignorant of the true moral requirements through no fault of their own. That is, they might not actually know what is right or wrong. Now, we're not talking about people that are cognitively impaired. I'm asking about people who have generally reflected upon what they think morality requires of them uh, and that have gathered the relevant information they need to respond to the moral claims that their society makes of them, but they dissent conscientiously anyway. So in many cases, when we do this in ordinary society, we say, oh, they're not going along with the rule because, say, that's their religion. Let me just give you an example. Uh, my wife's family several generations ago were all Mennonites, um, and they all still live in the Lancaster, Pennsylvania area. And so every Christmas I end up there, and we invariably get stuck behind an Amish horse and buggy. Now, it's kind of inconvenient because they're slow, and a lot of people don't like the fact that the horses sometimes tear up the roads. And if I didn't know anything about the Amish, if I didn't know anything about their deep, sincere convictions, I would think, what are these weirdos doing on the road? They're tearing up the road. They're slowing people down. This looks pretty dangerous. Why aren't they using more electricity? Um, isn't this bizarre? But if you know that this is their very deep conviction, and you know it must be sincere because they're paying spectacular social costs in, in following the religion that they do, I think we find that we don't hold them accountable. Right? We don't say that we resent the Amish or that we're indignant with the Amish because we generally think that they are people of goodwill who have reflected upon what's required of them, but they just happen to be mistaken about that. So in many cases, I think conscientious dissent excuses, even if people are mistaken about what morality requires. So we hold people accountable when we think they should have known better to act as they did, but there are cases of people who are mistaken about morality where it's not appropriate to say that they should have known than to act as they did. So the recognition that others dissent conscientiously undermines our reactive attitudes. And my claim will be here in just a moment that our practice of holding accountable can only be sustained if the moral rules that exist are compatible with people's deep commitments and values, which, of course, I will understand in terms of public justification. So I still have to make that case for premises two and four. But notice what we will have accomplished. We will have shown that there's two duties of respect. The first duty is to be trustworthy with respect to moral rules. The other is to treat others as trustworthy. That is, we will only blame and punish people that we think are accountable for being untrustworthy. So we incentivize trustworthy behavior with two duties. People both have a moral reason 
to be trustworthy, and they have a moral reason to only penalize people who are untrustworthy. Now, this is absolutely critical for sustaining the system of trust because, again, we can't just point to its benefits. Trust is a response to perceived trustworthiness. And people have these duties to incentivize trustworthiness. We have moral duty to be trustworthy, and we're only going to penalize people when we think they're untrustworthy. So we have moral reasons that will create trustworthiness, and as people observe trust, it will rationally justify their trust, right? When they observe trustworthiness, they will see that their trust is justified. So that is how we can sustain a system of trust and maintain and enjoy its great value by appealing to these duties of respect. And the case for the public justification requirement is that it specifies the compatibility relation between the moral rules that apply to us and our personal commitments, our values, our integrity, our conscience, or something like that. So for those of you who are familiar with public reason views, you might think of the notion of public justification as a kind of discursive act. We go out in public and we justify things to each other in terms of reasons that all the public can appreciate. And the reason that this is associated with public justification is because it's how most people in the literature talk. But I understand that as merely a way of bringing about the relation of public justification. In the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry on public justification that I co-authored with Fred D'Agostino, we instead define public justification as a three-place relation between an agent, her reasons, and some law, policy, or norm that's applied to her. And the relation is specified in the following way. Some rule or policy L is publicly justified for A if and only if A has sufficient reason R to endorse L. And we can say that L is generally justified when each person to whom the rule is applied has sufficient reason of her own to endorse, internalize, and comply with the rule. Now, public reason liberals differ because they specify these variables, the agent, her reasons, and the law, or the norm, in different ways. And I can't give you all the arguments for why I specify them as I do, but I want to say something relatively brief about each one. I've written a great deal on these conditions, and I'm happy to uh, expand upon them in the Q&A. First, I've already made the case that the value for L here is a moral rule. I mean, that's just been the subject that we've been talking about. Other people think L just includes laws or constitutional essentials, um, but I'll build my way up to that. So instead, we have to focus on how to understand agents and how to understand their reasons. And when we're trying to make sense of whether people have reason to comply with the rule that's applied to them, whether it fits with their deep projects and principles, we will need to engage in what philosophers call idealization. That is, we need to appeal to what people would accept if they had adequate information um, and had processed things uh, to an appropriate degree. Because if we just appeal to people's present acceptances, what they presently will say they're for or against, we're not going to necessarily have an account, uh, an account of their deep convictions and values because they might be confused or misreporting what, what they really believe or something along those lines. Now, of course, we should always listen to what people say. What they say is the very best evidence of what they have reason to do, right? We should be extremely hesitant to second guess them. But if we really want to come up with an explanation of when their projects and plans and principles are compatible with what society expects of them, we're going to need to ask what reasons they would acknowledge if they reflected on it. On the other hand, we can't radically idealize people. We can't say, what reasons would they acknowledge if they knew all the relevant facts and had a huge amount of time to process all the relevant information? To see this, you might imagine, just for the moment, that Roman Catholicism is a false religion. Now, maybe radically idealized agents would see this, and so nuns would see, when fully idealized, that they have no reason to keep their vows of poverty and chastity. But I think it would be a mistake to say that even if Roman Catholicism is false, that nuns have no reason to keep their vows of poverty and chastity. Given what they believe, given their commitments, that's what they have reason to do. So we want to idealize, we don't want to idealize too much. And so I've developed another work uh, an account of moderate idealization. Next, we have to give an account of the sorts of reasons that people have that can figure into public justifications. The standard view in the literature is that the reasons that can justify applying the moral rules and laws that society apply to us 
have to be ones that everybody shares or that everybody would share at the right level of idealization. I've argued against this shared reasons requirement in a number of places. I think it has a number of problems. But I, I hope we can see that this is just a non-starter for the project that I'm engaged in. We're trying to make sense of how people in all their diversity could have reason given their own diverse projects and plans to go along with the moral rules that society apply to them. So we can't say that the rules would be justified solely by appeal to the ones that people share with everyone else. People have to be able to appeal to the full set of all the reasons that I call intelligible in order to make sense of whether their projects and plans and their integrity give them reason to go along with a moral rule or not. So I expand the set of reasons that figure into public justifications uh, very, very broadly, perhaps broadly, uh, more broadly than anyone in the literature. What this does then is it gives us a specification of the idea of public justification. Moderate ide moderately idealized agents must have sufficient intelligible reason to endorse the moral rules that apply to them. And this public justification constraint is going to specify the compatibility relation. And so it's going to support premises two and four. And I can just say a bit about how that would work. Let's distinguish between the reasons that we have to follow the, our society's rules that some people call second personal reasons, other people call society anchored reasons. These are reasons often of, of justice or of reciprocity or fairness. These are our rules, the rules of society that people expect us to follow, and so we should go along with it because uh, they're effective, they help us to cooperate and get along. On the other hand, we have our personal reasons, our own integrity, our conscience, and the kind of reasons for action that are implied by those. And what public justification is supposed to do is specify when these social or society anchored or second personal reasons congrue with or fit with our kind of first personal reasons, the reasons of our own individual and personal and social ideals. So what the public justification constraint do, does is it specifies when the reasons implied by our shared moral rules are compatible with the reasons implied by our own personal ideals and commitments. And by appealing to moderate idealization and a broad understanding of what we have reason to do, we specify that compatibility relation in what I regard as a philosophically attractive way. So that's why I think premises two and four are true, and I've told you why I think premises one and three are true, and so we have the case for our two duties of respect, which drive people to be trustworthy, and so generate trust, and so sustain the system of trust, and so yield the benefits of the system of trust. So the case for the public justification constraint is that it figures into these duties which drive trustworthiness, which justifies trust, which has great benefits. Now, I know there's a number of steps there, but I think you can sort of see how the story goes. And I think there's been so much work, particularly over the last 25 years, attempting to flesh out public reason views. And there's so many arguments that I think are unsuccessful. This is the general argument that I think has the most promise. Okay, well, we're nearly finished with my argument. Now I have to explain to you why I think that the law and political order requires public justification. Many public reason liberals only talk about the need to publicly justify law. And I think they have a hard time explaining why. And I myself faced this difficulty until uh, partly with Chad's help I uh, changed my mind. So here's the story that I will try to tell you now. The public justification of coercion is required only by extension. The heart of public reason is to justify our shared moral life together. And among those moral rules is a kind of presumption against legal coercion. We generally have an expectation that if the centers of power in our society are going to control and coerce us, that they better have a good reason. As we generally don't think that authorities can coerce for no reason at all, right? There's a kind of presumption against coercion based on a moral rule that I think is publicly justified for us. It's one we all acknowledge and expect, right? If the government's going to pass a law, there needs to be a reason for the law. And it should be a good reason. Now, I won't say much more about that presumption beyond that, but it's a presumption I think that has to be met. And the way in which law can meet that presumption is as follows. I want you to imagine for the moment what I call in the, my book a legal state of nature. This is a state of society where there's a system of trust with moral rules, but there's no law, and there are no judges whatsoever, not to mention no state and no constitution and no democracy. 
Now, this is a social order where we have moral commitments to one another. And among those moral commitments are an obligation that when we have disputes with one another, including about what's even morally required, that we submit to some kind of uh, impartial third party. But in the legal state of nature, all we have is the court of public opinion with all of the many flaws that it has. And so what I think moderately idealized people will see is that by complying with a certain restricted set of laws and a court system, that they can better live out the obligations that they have one another to resolve their disputes in a timely and reliable and effective way. So the way that laws meet the presumption against coercion is that by complying, we see that by complying with these laws, we efficiently improve upon our moral order's ability to satisfy or to achieve its own aims. So the idea is that laws get justified as supplements to the moral order, effective supplements. And of course, since the laws are supplements to the moral order, they require public justification just as the moral rules do. So the explanation of how public justification for law works is that it's necessary to help sustain the system of trust. And when each person has reason to accept the law of their own, they'll have reason to go along with it and not to skirt it or disobey with it, so the law will be effective and of general application. Now we can imagine a state of mere law. That's a state where you have a legal system and you have a system of social norms, but you don't have any publicly recognized way of changing the law. For that, you need constitutional rules that specify, say, that there is to be a legislature and that they can change the law when there's a majority vote. Constitutional rules are justified with respect to legal rules in a parallel way as legal rules are justified with respect to moral rules. The constitutional rules are effective supplements to the legal order. By complying with constitutional rules, we will be able to change the law, get rid of bad laws, change out of date laws, improve good laws, and so our order will generally be more effective. For instance, we have a way to change unjust laws, laws that we owe one another to get rid of. So we publicly justify then in three layers. We take the set of moral rules that apply to us all, and we must publicly justify those. We justify legal rules on top of that as supplements to the moral order. And we justify constitutional order and political order in this top layer as a supplement to the legal and moral orders. Now I know that I've run through this rather quickly. And it's because the vast majority of this talk draws on the first two chapters of my book. Section 7 of the handout is all of chapter 3, and section 8 is all of chapters 4, 5, and 6. Uh, so there's detail there, there's argument there, but I wanted you to see what the upshot of the model was. How could it be that we would ever care about publicly justifying coercion? And now we can see what the answer is, right? For, by now it should be fairly familiar. A system of trust has enormous value. But to sustain the system, we need to incentivize trustworthiness based on moral reasons. And we can do that because we have duties of respect to be trustworthy and to treat others as trustworthy. We care about public justification because we only have a duty to be trustworthy with respect to publicly justified rules. And we should treat others as trustworthy and so only hold them accountable for violations of publicly justified rules. Then, once we see the need to publicly justify the moral order, we can see the necessity of having a legal system and the need to publicly justify the legal order. So that's the basic account that I have of why I think coercion requires public justification and so why I think a particular version of the public justification constraint is true. Now, I know for many of you, particularly the undergraduates, a lot of the argumentation here has been a little lofty. I started off by telling you that one of my deepest questions was how could liberal order itself be justified? But I haven't said very much about that at all. Now again, as I said, um, there's only so much that you can do in a talk. Um, but I think I will say just a little bit. I've given you the story about the public justification constraint, and now I would need to show, as I do in the last three chapters of my book, how liberal institutions are justified by appeal to that constraint. And the general way that liberal institutions get justified is as follows. 
we recognize that in any free society, any mass society, people have a wide variety of different views of the good life, of justice and religion, or the lack of religion. And so people are going to have a wide array of differing reasons to live out their own diverse and incompatible projects and plans. And that means that if we take any one person's sectarian doctrine, their ideology or their religion, and we say, let's make it the law, everyone else will have sufficient reason to reject that imposition. That is, a particular sectarian or substantive controversial understanding of the good or religion can't be publicly justified to everyone. And so it can't be the basis of an ongoing respectful system of trust among diverse persons. That means what we all must do, if we wish to maintain the system of trust and to treat one another with adequate respect, is to back off of those more ambitious political goals to institutionalize what we take to be the full moral, political, and religious truth. So in any diverse society, what we'll do instead is default to the regular familiar scheme of liberal liberties that allow all of us to live our own lives in our own way. Because each of us can say, I will accept those as protections from others dominating me, and in exchange, out of reciprocity and respect for others, I will also forego that same right. So the ultimate foundation, the ultimate public justification for liberal order is it's the only order that can't be justifiably rejected because any other order is going to involve prioritizing some person's reasonably disagreed upon or rejected point of view. So, if you want to know why liberal institutions are justified, it's that liberal institutions are uniquely publicly justifiable. And if you want to know why I care about public justification, well, I've just told you. Thank you.